Hello and welcome to the probably last part of the Brother LW35 modernization project after basically prototyping up every single component of the system on a breadboard now it's time to bring it all onto a well still a breadboard but not a solarless one so that we can con so that we can permanently install it in the machine and that's what this part is going to be about about integrating everything onto a single PCB as you can see uh, it's actually quite far already almost done and then of course writing the Linux drivers for it right now I'm working on the printer and as you can see over here at first I just did essentially its first real uh, print that worked successfully no problem just um, piped in serial data into the print buffer and it printed it out nicely line breaks everything and, and the print to right to left then sorry, left to right, then right to left, and so on, worked nicely. Um, no offs, no, no weird offset is happening, I think. So that's all really nice. I just saw one bug where at the end of this print run, it sh suddenly started printing garbage. I have no idea what happened, but it seems like the buffer kind of wrapped around. So that's not good, I need to look at that. But apart from this, the hardware definitely is fully functional. I tested all features and all of them work perfectly fine. There were some changes to the prototype, so I had to change a couple of things in, this, uh, in firmware. Also, I had already started working with SPI, but then I decided to do everything here with UART and have SPI only for the display driver. Uh, so I had to rewrite firmware there as well, but that's fine, that's fine. Another fun story uh, on the side that cost me a little bit of time is I have an AVR here. This was my printer controller at first. However, I had to ch uh, swap it out because it turns out this chip is defective. At first I thought it was just a little glitchy or maybe I had a problem in my program because sometimes it wouldn't really start up and at some point that problem went away so I thought yeah okay must be a problem in my code but then I noticed that for some reason the power consumption was unusually high. So right now the board with all the chips on takes 67 milliamps. However then it was suddenly at 105 with this chip in there um, as soon as, as the bootloader exited in my program run and I thought that can't be. Uh, so I investigated it a bit. It turns out there's one, one I.O. Uh, pin is shot. Interestingly it still fully works. The only problem is when I drive it low uh, the chip draws 40 milliamps plus uh, um, in, yeah, in addition to its normal power consumption, so no idea what happens there, but that chip is shot. So I got a different, different chip, uh, and with this one everything works. So I was just reading through this failed print and just looking at the stuff, and then suddenly I noticed something. It has this uh, string here, wrap plus, and I knew that from somewhere. And yeah, then it clicked. Uh, that wrap plus is part of a printf in in my C code, so I'm pretty sure I just ram, uh, ran out of RAM again. So my heap and stack are colliding with each other and overlapping now, and that's probably what happened, so yeah, I screwed up. But that's easy to fix because this is all debugging code anyways, um, and it's gonna be removed. So I'm happy about that. Not much to fix there. So here we are again, it's quite a bit later and a couple of things have changed so the project is finally coming to a close. Pretty much everything works now so let's just quickly go over the changes since last time. First of all this little section down here, that's the power supply for the, uh, for the negative 21 volts that we need for uh, as the contrast voltage for the LCD. So before I always generated that using my lab power supply now everything is pretty much integrated onto this board and this system can operate standalone. Also for operating standalone I now have in the back there a 5 volt DC DC converter so I do also not need to generate those from the 8 volts from the other power supply because it might not be rated for that current and then overheat or just not work because if we look at this the power supply is a completely linear power supply with a transformer in front of it. I don't think I want to draw all the current that this orange Pi PC, even though it's quite power efficient, uh, draws from the power supply. 
so uh, that's some progress and then the major other things were software related so i've changed the firmware or written the firmware and fixed a lot of things on the printer controller on the keyboard controller basically everywhere and of course the kernel drivers have changed a lot as well so basically now the system is fully operational so what i'll do next is probably show you all the functions and how they work right now but for this i'll first have to put the plug the keyboard back in and flip this whole thing over all right so let's turn it on And here it is, booted and ready to use. So let's log in. As you can see, a totally normal Linux shell. I'm um, running Arch Linux with the kernel 5.7.0, which is the latest kernel I could grab from the next branch on kernel.org at the time of filming this video. So let's see what we can do with it. First of all, let's just do the usual stuff we just Need to do here's nail fetch so you can kind of see the system stats um we're currently running a 32-bit build of linux but the cpu also supports 64 bit so if you're into that you can totally do this usually i would run uh 64-bit but i don't know for some reason i apparently went with the rmv7 config here and i don't want to reinstall my rootfs and everything if i recompile i'd have to change that over as well so we're stuck with 32-bit, but it's more than it's it's totally fine for for this application. So let's see what else can we do. Uh, of course, the main thing of this machine will be typing because it's a typewriter, and the good and really great thing about it is distraction-free writing on a really good keyboard. So let's just open Nano and type something. Hello. So you can see this is standard GNU Nano running on this machine. Um, perfectly fine, and, and the keyboard is very responsive. The display on the other hand is not, and that's not my modification. This has always been a very slow panel, so it might make it appear a little bit slow, but it's not really. And I think it's okay while typing. Now one of the challenges when converting this to a computer was the keyboard layout, because a couple of keys are just simply missing we don't have control keys we don't have alt keys but for that we have these like delete word and delete line keys that are not really needed anymore so re so i repurposed those so for example here the code is going to be control so if we want to exit out now we press control x um i'm using the Dvorak keyboard layout on on my linux installation here so that's why that is x and not b but it would of course work so if we do for example load keys i think d dash latin one or something okay we need to do that as root oops now it should be german yep including the modifiers so if we now do nano uh, we can now type in german with all the umlauts and stuff that you'd have in this language and now it matches the keyboard layout but for me let's switch back to work for now so what else can we show off um so you can see right now we're running the lw35 ioc and the lmg 6202 ulit kernel drivers those are the two additional drivers that i added the upper one is the display the other one is the keyboard and the printer now let's see to init the key um to to initialize the let's first of all become root so because everything else uh, everything with the printer right now requires root permissions because i haven't set those up properly yet but let's initialize the printer. So to do this, we use the LW35 tool, set mode passive. And I just need to open the device once. 
and this will initialize the printer. Now, you heard some noise there in the background, that was the printer initializing, and if we now try hello world, and we echo this to slash def lw35, we should hear it print. So, all of that works. What else is there to show? Um, right, I was talking about the keyboard before. Let's just maybe go back to the keyboard for a second here. So, of course, all the numbers and keys here, they correspond to the normal keys that you find on a keyboard. Um, but then we've also got this key here, which is the new Alt key. So I can, for example, switch between the virtual TTYs. Um, this key, I'm honest, this key is the FN key. So some of these keys, because I didn't have enough keys uh, on this keyboard to represent all the keys from a normal keyboard, uh, I, had a, I had to implement F an FN key just as laptops do. So for example, if we have some stuff here and we want to um, use pos one we press fn and this one and now you can see the cursor is at the beginning and i had to do a couple of these um things let's see um same for example for here usually you'd have the till key which now is here on sm so i basically moved the key that would be here because we have a super large tab key and usually we'd have the tilde here but we have more, more key, uh, one more key on the right, so I just use that one as the leftmost one, and now we have the tilde and the back tick here. Um, let's see what else. I think this one here is the delete key. Yep. So we have backspace and delete, where they're mostly, well, not kind of where they're supposed to be. I, I find myself pressing this one here instead very often. But yeah, I mean, the keyboard layout is customizable, so it's not a big deal. Okay, some more stuff. Um, of course, we have an Ethernet link on this thing, so we have internet. It's kind of contradicting the whole distraction-free writing thing, but I think it's still cool to have. So, uh, what you can, of course, do is use, for example, programs like RTV, which is a command-line Reddit browser. So, let's open that up, and we can navigate to r slash Linux and read a post. There we go, and now we can use again fn plus down is, is page down. And we can read through this post. Hello, I'm new to Linux. I think I got So you can see that's pretty cool. So let's leave that again. Yes, I want to exit. Yep. Um, or of course we can just use W3M directly and read websites that way. So let's see. Let's open that site and we can read it. Technology is becoming more and more complex every day. Devices get smaller, integration gets higher. So. You can see it's pretty pretty good actually for viewing content like this. Simple websites, of course, only work. Now, and the last thing will be a quick peek at a feature that isn't well. It's essentially fully working, but totally useless. And that is that we can run an X server on this machine. So theoretically, it's possible to launch a full desktop environment and everything. Right now, I do have my. As you can see, X in at RC, my X in a co configure to just launch MPV with a test movie. So if we now do start X, it should start MPV and start playing a movie. It won't be that great because it's a super wide screen screen with no vertical resolution at all. But you can see essentially this box is able to play movies. Um, this is a very cartoony kind of thing. And you can see even here we have some issues and it doesn't really like we don't have dithering, we don't have all the interesting stuff to make a black and white screen look good right now, but as a proof of concept, hey, you can see we have X running on this thing and even MPV playing movies. That's pretty neat. There's one other big feature that I want to show you. 
um, that took actually quite a bit, to, uh, quite a while to implement, but it works really well now. And that is remote firmware updates. So we have the FPGA and the two microcontrollers on the board, and I wanted to be, up to, uh, be able to update uh, these components from what, like when the case is closed up without a programmer. Uh, for the FPGA, I decided in the end it's not really worth the effort. Um, because of this, I won't have to change anything about the display controller in the future, but the two AVRs I should definitely be able to update remotely, and that's what I implemented. So basically, the tool set can put the, each of these controllers into a programming mode, and then we can um, update them. So what you're seeing right now is my is the screen on my main PC, so not the device itself. I'm not logged in via SSH or anything, so this is my development machine. And what we can do here is simply like here's uh, the AVR firmware. So this is just the um, printer firmware, for example. And if we want to flash this onto the system, so let's say we made some changes and want to test this uh, now, we can just enter make RFU for remote firmware update and hit enter. And what you'll see now is the system connecting via SSH to my uh, to the LW35 and then flash the new firmware and bam, the firmware update is done and the system is back up and running again without reboot, without anything. It's just the IO controller that was reset now and everything is back to life now, which is pretty cool. Um, it, it really made development a lot faster and easier and will, up, will enable updates after the whole thing has been closed up, which was really important for these two components. Yeah, I, I think that's pretty much it for this update. Then... Um, so let's let's take a let's take a moment to talk about what is still missing. So obviously I need to reassemble it, but before this I want to figure out something to do about this hole here. So right now we just have the, the orange pie hanging here, hanging out of the device here. That is obviously not a cool thing to do. So I want to either yeah I will probably want to look into maybe three D printing a cover that I can put on here that still allows me to pull the device out if I need it, because. If I just lock everything in, if I just if, if I install everything permanently, I have the problem. Like if the SD card fails or I break the system, it'll be an absolute pain to get to it. And knowing myself, that happens quite often that I break my installations to the point of where they don't boot anymore, and I need access to the boot media. Because sadly, I think I'm not sure I should check. This thing does not support USB boot, or I'd have to update the bootloader. I don't know. I, I could look into up, uh, USB boot. So. I, it would be another solution, but I'll probably try and figure something out that allows me to remove the computer if I want to. Mm, yeah, so I think that's it. Let's just oops, let's shut her down. And yeah, that's the other thing right now. I mean, this thing does not have a power um, power control or anything, so it's the old-fashioned way where I shut it down and basically it's done shutting down and you you have to kill the power just like in the old days so yeah there we go okay so i think that's it with the vlog series for the lw35 there will be one more video and one blog post on my website where i feature the final build um, in a bit more detail in a bit more polished way than these vlogs so you can look forward to that um, I don't know whether I will have the front cover ready for the video or not, because I don't want to push it like even further. This project has been going on for way too long already, but it was fun and and it was very like it was probably one of the most difficult project I've, projects I've ever done. It included microcontroller programming, it included FPGAs, it included Linux drivers and the whole uh, system on module or um, single board computer stuff. Um, yeah, I learned a lot doing this project, so it was pretty cool. And I'm looking forward to kind of using this for, as I said, the printer is probably kind of useless. It's still fun and all, but it is, it's probably not very practical. So what I'm going to use this machine for is distraction-free writing, because that's what it's good at. Okay, so we'll talk to you in the next video then. Bye.